Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to joining us on this very important session. We are glad to have Peter Maguire, who is the CEO of XM Australia and is a key representative of the firm's Australian Financial Services. He has over 20 years of experience from financial services industry real estate with extensive knowledge on overall commodities, especially crude, met crude and metals. He is a proven media, uh, media presenter to various audiences globally. So Peter, uh, as, as we know, we we are speaking on this topic on you know the current topic which is going on on this China power crisis and you know how global commodity prices are all going up, be it on in the energy side of things, be it coal side of things, and how it's basically impacting the supply chains as well. So. Peter, what would be your initial views on what is the current scenario? How deep is it? What is like, how widespread is the problem? And what do you think of the current situation? Well, uh, first off, thanks for inviting me on the show. And it's a pleasure to um, talk to you from live from Sydney, Australia. And to everyone out there, all the very best in good health. Now, I think where we are at the moment, in a nutshell, the impact on the commodity prices depends on the commodity in question. So we've seen some of the base metals perform quite poorly, for example, copper, and we've seen some of the base metals perform incredibly well, be it uh, aluminium, have a look where crude oil is, have a look where uh, natural gas is, and of course where coal prices are. So it just depends on the actual commodity. Anything related to energy generation will probably do well while anything related to heavy industry and manufacturing probably comes under a bit of a problem in the sense it could struggle. So as we unpack this, one needs to be conscious of the big picture. Coal prices have gone through the roof of mid shortages and we're very conscious of it from Australia. The Australian import ban and tighter environmental regulations uh, create, I think, a disconnect in a lot of ways. And coal is how China generates more than half of its power. So. We're very, when we look at these, um, the storylines as far as new age energy and the appreciation to burn, um, you know, or, or remove ourselves from fossil fuels, the realisation is that we're still generating an enormous amount of our energy from coal. So to respond to the government started rationing energy with heavy industry and factories that consume the most suffering blackouts. Now that's where China's strategy is. And this will inevitably hit already struggling supply chains and companies, squeezing margins, and of course, product, production costs will rise. And, and the storyline there is that it exports their inflation across the planet. So there's the first part of it. So I hope that that gives you something to work off. Right. Thanks, Peter. I mean that's pretty uh, uh, that's pretty insight, insightful. So my second question is on the same thing. Do you think that you know uh, basically? I think China you uh, China used to import about fifty million tons of coal in twenty nineteen from Australia. Uh, yeah, doing they did something around 30, uh, 35, 40 million tons in last year. And uh, since November of last year, they basically announced the trade. Uh, I mean, the coal import ban. So where do you think China can basically source this coal from and uh, what are the alternate supply chains do they have or is it like going to be a longer term problem for them? Well, I think a couple of points. One thing we have to be mindful of, if you lock Australia out, and I want to go into the raw numbers because the numbers are the numbers. And when you're talking business strategy or you're talking any any um, commodity, you want to dig down deep into the numbers. And at the moment, um, as far as import, China's importing around about 6.61 exajoules. So India at about 4.22, Japan at about 4.56, Europe at 3.9, and South Korea at 3.26. So that, that just sets the scene, those five largest importers. South Korea, Europe, Japan, India, and China, the number one. So we say, well, right, oh, what happens? We, we've got those five large importers. Then we've got to look at who the biggest exporters are. And we take on board the appreciation as far as exporters. Well, the number one exporter in the world is Australia. 
at 9.25. The next one is, is Indonesia at 8.51, Russia at 5.66. Then it falls very much to the floor, Colombia at 1.66 and the US at 1.62. So those five largest, Australia, Indonesia, Russia, Colombia and US, if you add up number five, four, three, and uh, yes, five, four, and three, that would just about equal what 80% uh, of what Australia exports. So we are, uh, we are in a lot of ways, and when I say we, I, I refer to Australia. Australia in the coal industry is more of a gigantic player or a whale if I use Saudi Arabia, Russia, and the US, because they're all going back two years ago, pre-COVID, they're all exporting, or they're all producing around that similar number as far as a headline number per day barrels of crude. They were three equals. When it comes to exporting, oil, uh, exporting coal, Australia, is number one, and then you've got Indonesia. The difference is Australia's, we're such a unique nation that we've got such a big footprint of land, but there's no people, of which many Indians are here in Australia, and thank God they are here because I, I like going to you know wonderful people, but that they just can't believe that I talk to them. They just cannot believe that you've got the size of Mumbai nearly for the whole population of Australia. So. We've got Indonesia as the number two player, but the point is that Indonesia's got a population based 220 odd million people. Their demand picture for, for electricity is like that, going off the Richter scale. And these are all points that I've been talking for many, many years to a deaf ear, I've got to say that, to a deaf ear on TV. Because I would always say the electricity consumption is going to be far greater from a from a, uh, uh, from a standpoint as far as utilisation and cons consumption of it, that is going to make crude oil, crude oil was always already there nearly at peak, 100 million barrels, so it went up another 1 million barrels a day. Electricity um, demand is absolutely parabolic. So this is going to be a great dilemma. China can choose what it wants. Let's just see how China plays if they have a very bitterly cold winter and how they're going to uh, heat their homes if they're not getting Australian or Australian coal. So I'm passing it back over to you. Sure, sure. Participants, if you have any questions, you may please post your questions in the Q&A and we'll uh, ask Peter to take them up. In between, Peter, I'll just uh, ask a kind of a follow-up question on, on the same that, you know, uh, the what you're saying is basically electricity demand is going up. And so Peter, I was just basically asking that, you know, world over there's this whole ESG theme going on on wind, solar and hydro as renewable sources of energy trying to replace uh, thermal or coal power plants. So, so where do you, do you think there's been like kind of an underinvestment in the last five to 10 years, which, which is basically precipitated this crisis or do you think there's this just a short-term lag impact of you know the australia china trade deal and that's that's where it is well if i use um a, 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 i think the numbers tell the numbers and if we're looking at um, the world's biggest consumers china consumes about 82.27 exajoules of coal per year. Now, it's, it's monstrous. It's nearly five times the amount of India. So like it or not, while, while they are a big um, uh, producer of coal and they do a lot of mining and they naturally have uh, one of the, well, they're the largest producer by, it just dwarfs everyone else at nearly 81 exajoules. They're their consumption is monstrous. So they are absolutely addicted to coal-fired and electricity. 
So this, the issue moving forward is how does China wean itself from there? I know that they've had issues also as far as weather that has impacted their, um, their mining in recent months. So they've either got to do two or three things. And, and it's so it takes such a long period of time to implement different strategies. They either ramp up nuclear. And I remember Jim Rogers saying the great challenge with China is, uh, I, I remember him saying this a decade ago, probably 15 years ago. I met Jim up in, um, in Hong Kong in, in 2006. Uh, and I vividly recall him saying the problem you face in India, in China is, that fresh water for uh, uh, nuclear power plants. So yeah. I'm not sure how they get around that. Maybe it's got to be more natural gas. Maybe they've got to mine more coal. But uh, their dilemma at the moment is, where are they going to fill that shortfall up? And I don't think it's that easy to just turn on supply. Quite simply, there's not that abundance out there like there is with the oil market. The oil market is unique. I follow OPEC and I, I, I go to the OPEC meetings and they seem to say, well, we'll find another 400,000 or another million barrels a day and it just automatically appears. There's that much excess capacity out there that they can just turn a tap and there it is. Coal's a different matter completely. So that really creates issues moving forward and I'm not sure how this is going to play out, but the one issue that really hits everyone between the eyes is the price. And the price has been parabolic really since June of this year, April, May, June. And we're now at $240 for a ton of, um, uh, ton of coal. It's just onward and upward. And I'm not sure where the headline's going to be, but where it's going at the moment, is it going to be a 260, 280? Is it going to be $300? It just seems to be onward and upward. It's just having a dramatic move to the upside. Sure. Sure, Peter. Peter, I've received a couple of questions from the participants, you know. Uh, one of the questions is basically, is, is it a short-term impact uh, of the China power crisis? Is it due to coal supply imbalance or is it, also due to Chinese policy policymakers' ambition to control the emissions. A lot of uh, news what we hear and what we hear about is the Winter Olympics in Feb 2022. And China is basically trying to showcase itself as, you know, one moving away from fossil power and, you know, trying to control emissions and uh, emissions and also what are your views on the same? I, look, I, I think that you know, first off, the 2022 Olympics, I understand that and I take on board and what they present to the world is very important for their, uh, yeah, their overall strategies. And the, the other side of it is that are they able to work through this current dilemma? And if they can't get access to sufficient coal, over the next couple of months, then, and I wouldn't be surprised you're going to have other players possibly looking for more as well. There's every chance, you know, the way Japan's moving and the way that South Korea, there could be an increase as far as a demand picture there. So there, it gets to a point in time that price could be the true discovery mechanism of who actually gets the coal, who wants it bad enough. Because it's such a it's it's such a hot commodity at the moment, demonstrated with price, that uh, China's ambitions has to get through the current winter period, and like it or not, they're traditionally they're coming out of a COVID environment. Their electricity demand it has increased quite considerably, and the storyline is we've got to get through this. Uh, November, December, January, February, March period. I'm not sure how it plays out. I'm not sure whether they extend an olive branch to Australia and they, uh, you know, turn the turn the love meter back on and we um, we help them tremendously, or they continue with the current um, mindset of uh, restricting some of our trade. 
I think we've got to be very careful, Australia. We've been compromised on many different commodities uh, by China. And maybe the uh, bargaining tool has got to be one of looking at, um, you know, opening the floodgates that we can trade our way out due to the uh, economic crises that we've been presented with due to COVID. So uh, my question is, due to this power crisis in China, what industries do you think have been impacted the most? And, you know, uh, do you see, think there are opportunities for other countries, you know, to de-risk themselves from, from China, basically, and uh, de-risk the supply chains and move ahead to other countries, uh, take their supply chains to other countries to de-risk themselves from the power crisis and uh, going ahead? Well, I think a couple of things, um, a couple of points. The implications for the West is quite consider considerable because Chinese factory prices start rising that will export inflation across the globe. So we're very mindful of that point. We're also mindful that there's a light stagflation environment and that really creates a dilemma for anyone that studied economics or anyone that appreciates you. With high inflation, you normally curtail that by jacking rates up. But if you've got a stagflation or a light stagflation environment, that's not a good sign to put rates up. You actually want to stimulate growth. So it's a, it's a dilemma that creates much of a headache for any central banker. So growth might be slow because supply bottlenecks and painful deleveraging in the real estate sector. So we've got to be conscious. The Evergrande situation hasn't worked its way out yet. Construction accounts for a rat, part of the, um, well, the construction industry and, and property, that sector accounts for about 31% of GDP for China. Evergrande is the number two producer of uh, homes, my understanding, and they produce around about 600 odd thousand a part of homes a year, so it's a huge business. And we've got to get through that over the next three to six weeks and see what other um, companies or conglomerates, whether they have a similar, um, a similar dilemma in the sense of servicing their debt. So that painful deleveraging has got to come to, uh, come to pass. And then we've got the inflation could fire up as companies pass some of the increased costs down to consumers. So I'm no doubting that that'll happen. I mean, you can't have coal, coal going from $60 to $260 and, and electricity prices going up and you can't, and you don't pass that on and you've got, that just doesn't happen. So the implications that I mentioned, Chinese factory pricing starting to rise. The wild card for industrial commodities is whether Beijing will open the stimulus credit taps to offset the economic slowdown. So I'll just read that again. The wild card for industrial commodities, and there that's the, that's the ones that we're looking for or looking at, is whether Beijing will open the stimulus credit taps to offset the economic slowdown. If so, that could be a game changer for commodities like iron ore. But that's a gamble, as juicing up an already over-leveraged private sector could backfire. Hence, any stimulus measures will probably be mild, or as the Chinese say, not flood-like stimulus. So there's the, there's the issue that we face, and that's the context of the argument. Where are we? And, and, and what are all of those moving parts? Where do we see some... Uh, common sense and what is the approach of government and how does it look over the next, I, I think, you know, four to 16 weeks, that sort of time frame will, could change coal consumption and certainly could change uh, the energy demands over that Northern Hemisphere winter. Peter, we have... Mr. Madhav Martha, who wants to ask us a question. Please, Madhav, yeah, go sure. ahead and ask a question. Yeah, so it is... Yes, uh, uh, yeah, am I audible? Yes, yes, yes. please go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. Please. My question is related to a previous question that was just asked, uh, but uh, 
just wanted to understand that um, you know there have been a there have been frequent disruptions in china in the last uh, few years uh, from the environmental clampdown to to the current energy crisis uh, do you think that this can further accelerate uh, supply chains shifting out of uh, china and are there any particular industries or sectors where you think uh, this could be more uh, prominent in terms of uh, factories moving out to other parts of the globe well it, it, this the first part does come down to competitiveness and it comes down to if it's cheaper production and we've noticed that many companies are changing their footprint and moving to other locations across asia from a manufacturing hub so there's the first part the second part does come down to uh the competitiveness of nations and 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 tax incentives and uh that's just a normal part of policy to create uh opportunities for other firms or for incumbent firms looking for somewhere new to manufacture and produce their goods so that is just an ongoing moving target that in any business strategy you've got to you've got to be mindful what the input costs are and whether it can be done cheaper uh in a more cost effective manner which in turn is a benefit to stockholders so there's that the second part is what sectors will it depends on what your business model is and whether you can take advantage of it i look at it from you know an operator of a company uh, if we're manufacturing in let's say in spain can we do it somewhere cheaper and and what are the benefits going to be from a supply chain perspective so that really comes down to whether a company has an appetite to move secondly what the prospects are as far as tax incentives and competitiveness and the third part is um which is the which is the greatest challenge no one i don't think not anyone in this world owns a customer forever so no government owns that owns that company to do business and to manufacture in that country forever and that's the competitive nations or that's the competitiveness that always presents itself that's the that's the the wake up call so i think this decade is going to be one of much excitement much opportunity and where where does one profit from opportunity uh that comes down to yeah studying financials and appreciating uh strategic initiatives that companies like for example BHP said we don't want to be in oil anymore you've just got to look at their strategic intent and where they where they want to redefine their business model and that comes you know you look at analyst reports you study what uh what the what the crowds feeling and the crowd seems to be looking at um, yeah new areas and new places to do business peter we have another question with us and this is like um, this is relevant to from an australian standpoint is like let's say assume china does not roll out the olive branch to australia and basically it goes on with its uh, trade war with australia how would you think yes. from from the supply side of you know production of coal today from australian standpoint and how do you manage this risk from from a from a company's perspective and what what do you think is uh, the right way to look at things if i read the question what you're saying the the issue is you can say you don't want australian coal and that's and that's fine but you've got to secure your demand from someone else and if everyone else by look at indonesia they it's a big coal producer with nearly 14 uh, exajoules if it consumes 6 and then you're looking at what it um uh, and uh now consumes 3.62 3.26 i should say i've just got some numbers here it gets down to how much can they export and the export numbers are nearly when you're looking at what they manufacture what they produce there isn't a lot of spare capacity and this is the issue indonesia there's only those really the only three company or three countries 
that you can call on. You call on Australia and you lock them out. They're number one. So you say, well, you don't want any Australian. So then you've got to go to Indonesia. Well, they've got 8.51 as far as export. That export may be already, that may be Japan. There could be other, other nations all across Asia. There could be South Korea, some of that coal's going to. So how much extra spare capacity is there? Then you go to somewhere like Russia, and then you've got to go all, and then it falls away to very small numbers being Colombia and USA. So it, this is the issue that China faces. There, I don't believe that there is just excess capacity out there that can just be turned on at a tap like the crude oil scenario. And there's the... There's the, uh, there's the issue, I think, in the short term. And for energy-related commodities, it's even more complex. They have already gone through with the stratosphere as far as natural gas, coal, and oil to a lesser extent. And we've got oil now at $83 a barrel, 82. So it's difficult to call for any massive gains from here. But it's also equal, yeah. equally difficult to call for a decline as there isn't any real solution in sight. In any case, if they simply remain at these levels, it would be a massive burden on consumers and ultimately on growth. So there's the issue. And uh, I think it's going to be a, a very, very uh, delicate situation. And how it plays out is going to be quite interesting ge to a point of geopolitics. Sure. Uh, we have another question from Vishal. Vishal, could you please unmute yourself and go ahead and ask your question? Uh, thank you. Uh, Peter, assuming that China and Australia get to the negotiating table, what would be the uh, aspects that Australia would be looking out for? Well, uh, I... I I, I think that's a very delicate situation and a very and, and I, that is a very hard question to answer because there are some significant political um, components of that of that uh, framework that need to be thought through. It was only a matter of over the last year that we had red wine, barley. There was, I think, um, numerous other commodities that were restricted to be exported to China. They said they, they were um, creating, uh, well, they, they were securing from other nations, which in turn greatly impacted uh, the Australian economy. So the government, one would hope, may look at how it's going to not extend an olive branch, but to work closely with China and to see whether some of those commodities can be reintroduced into the package because Australia has the upper hand at the moment. And that's the situation. So I, I, I'm not sure how it plays. It's a, it's, it, it, takes, um, it takes a great degree of, uh, uh, of discussion. And uh, I, I just want to, I, I'm, I'll, be, I'll be very interested to see how it all unwinds over the next matter of weeks and possibly months uh, because it's a delicate situation. And China would just be looking out for an apology from Australia or do you think China would also negotiate hard? Look, I don't know. Uh, I don't know what China is actually wanting us to say or do. Uh, I'm sitting here in Sydney, Australia, and we've been locked. We're in our fourth month of lockdown. The economic carnage to the nation, uh, to small business owners, has been immense. So um, yeah, that's the that's where we're. You know, the man on the street and, and what people are having to endure has uh, been very very difficult for them across the whole nation. Yeah, yeah. All right. Thank you, Peter. Thank you for your thoughts. You're more than welcome. Peter, just a follow-up question on, you know, from uh, from an Australian standpoint, we sitting here back in India, we, we also 
hearing some noise on power crisis and shortage on supply of coal. Uh, have you seen any uptick in, you know, coal exports from Australia to India in the recent months, given like China has kind of stopped export, uh, stopped taking imports from Australia? Well, I mean, the numbers don't lie. Quite simply, the biggest exporters are China, importers are China and India and Japan and Europe and South Korea, as I mentioned. And the biggest exporters are Australia, Indonesia and Russia. Those three, the other two are very, very small players, be they Colombia and USA. So it's nearly to the point, uh, if, you want the, if you want the product, then you've got to you've got to come to the table and negotiate and talk. And uh, it's as simple as that with any particular product. If you want the product, the, buy, the seller has, the, has control and the buyer needs to meet what the seller wants. And, and, the, and that's been dictated, I think, and demonstrated over the last matter of three to four months as far as that explosive move to the upside as far as price. And you know, you, it, it's two hundred and forty dollars approximately. So that's per ton. I'm looking at a chart here, and, and it just—I don't study coal prices every day. I don't live and breathe them. But when you really look at where we were in January, seventy-five dollars. Where we were last November was around sixty dollars, and here we are in October, and we're three hundred percent increase in the price in eleven months. That's that's extraordinary extraordinary but then again when you're thinking of what we've experienced and we had crude oil trading at 10 and 15 and 20 dollars we haven't had it go to minus 40 or nearly then we're at 80 odd dollars for a barrel right. of crude oil so that's the volatility of the commodity markets for you that's the exciting part of it right. there's never a dull moment in and certainly in the energy complex sure uh, Amit, please go ahead and ask your question. Amit Toparia. Hi, Peter. Uh, thank you for taking my question. Um, a couple of a couple of quick ones. Um, so I'm aware that uh, a part of the coal that uh, Australia used to sell to China is getting uh, routed to India. But uh, yeah. where is the rest of the coal going? Well, you've got all of those different markets that have got their hand out for it. And, you know, when you're thinking about the biggest importers, it, you look at China, you look at India, but then you think Japan, Europe, South Korea, and then you've got other parts of Asia that, um, that certainly want coal. So the, the demand picture, those big players, Japan, Europe, South Korea, They've got very, very big, they're number three, four, and five in the world as far as import. Japan is actually ahead of India, and, and Europe's not far behind India, and South Korea is only fractionally behind India. So, you know, they're, they're very, very big players, and uh, there's only so much coal, and I'm sure that the Australian uh, producers are mindful of who wants it and what they're prepared to pay for. I, I guess <clears throat> what I was asking was where's the rest of the Australian coal going? Because there's a there's clearly now one, one of your largest clients is out of the market, or at least is not buying coal from you. Well, that's right. Is, well, is, my, is, my is understanding Australia... is sorry. sorry. But my understanding was uh, the likes of Japan, Europe, South Korea. So uh, I'm sure that coal, the wonders of coal, it's a little bit like crude oil. You've got the reserves and uh, it's either in the ground or you can mine it. It's not as though it's like a, an agricultural commodity that it you know, goes off in about three to six months. Or like orange juice, coal uh, has a, it lasts for many, many lifetimes. Yes. So you put it out there, I'm sure it's, you know, it's still got the same amount of, um, you know, it's got the, it, it doesn't, it, it ages very well coal. So there's the issue that we can stockpile it here and then, um, yeah, supply it to uh, who's ever wanting to put their hand up to say, yes, we want to increase our import. Because one would have thought that, uh, you know, these countries are quite efficient in terms of their requirements. These are long-term contracts that they enter into. And you know, 
predominantly used for power plants. So there's not much uh, that someone can uh, 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 compensate for, um, yes. you know, when China shuts down. And so then that essentially means that basically nobody's mining this coal. That's not required. Well, that's right. I mean, you know, Australia, I, I'm sure that we're, uh, we've got the product. Um, and, and look, partnerships like that we've had with China have been ongoing for decades. So sometimes, like any marriage, you have, a, you have times that you fight with your spouse and other times that you're, um, you're not fighting and you're getting on and you've, you've got the most beautiful relationship. Well, at the moment, um, maybe we're coming back to the table to um, yeah, make some peace and uh, put, put those bad points behind us. And that's what we're working towards, I'm sure, from a government standpoint. And from the second phase, uh, there are other consumers out there that possibly are increasing their demand picture due to the electric uh, or the electrification of really the world. So I, I, I sit here in Australia and, and feeling fairly pleased of where we are and what we have as far as a export driven economy coal plays a big part of that and i'm sure that uh, it'll be played favorably for us over the next matter of years got it so it's not a supply issue it's a it's an offtake issue i.e what we're seeing in many of the commodities right now where there are real supply disruptions and there's there's, there's an absolute uh, in some cases there's an absolute shortage of uh, uh, offtake there is no shortage of coal as such it's just china needs to pick up needs to change its mind and sort of start picking up coal from the largest pro source of, uh, uh, of coal. That's correct. That's my understanding. And uh, their, their demand, they, they're a huge, uh, a huge producer, but there's a shortfall there and they need to make that shortfall up. And Australia is, a, uh, is, is available and it's just a work in progress to see where we move over the over the uh, short to medium term. Understood. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Ahmed. Uh, Peter, I have another question. Uh, this is on you know uh, on coking coal prices. Do you have a view on that? The one which we used to make in steel. I mean, that's also shooting through the roof as we speak. Yeah, I'm not a, no, I don't. I, I look at the demand picture and certainly for um, the, as far as price. Yeah, it, look, it's just been one way traffic for all of those um, uh, across the energy sector. I just sit here, I'm scratching the head. I, you know, I, the, the price point as far as nat gas, as far as, as you mentioned, coke and coal, thermal coal, and you know the oil market has just been extraordinary growth to the upside. And there's, it gets to a point that um, I think over the next five, 10, 15 years, there's going to be, considering we're coming out of COVID, that much construction, that much rebuilding of cities, that much underground railways and, you know, for example, Mumbai, you know, you can imagine the underground networks and how much steel would be required if you did, you know, the, the 20 largest cities in India. And, you know, you start, it's just extraordinary what we are going to see as far as the demand picture for coke and coal and for steel production over the coming decades is going to be extraordinary, I think. So, yeah, I, I don't think that, uh, first off, consumption is going to be very, very strong. And the second part, of course, is uh, the rebuilding after COVID and massive infrastructure spends really across the world from the majority of governments, I think. So, uh, yeah, it's, it's a good time to be a miner, great time to be... Um, uh, well, it, it's a great time for mankind. It's a great time because we, we, I think we will have a better quality of life and better transportation hubs in 
many of the major cities of the world. Sure. Peter, another question which, uh, which is related to the crude and natural gas markets. We, I mean, we've spoken a lot about coal, but uh, um, they, they too, as, as you mentioned, they're shooting through the roof and uh, OPEC continues to basically control supplies plus uh, the, the issue from Russian gas imports into Europe making natural gas prices go up over there so so yeah. what are your views on the crude oil and, crude oil and natural gas markets and uh, what do you think is going to play out over the next three to six months because uh, over there the, the slightly more complex issue is going on which uh, which if you could help us explain what 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 do you think from your standpoint well if i look at price i think you're going to see continue uptick i'm not sure how much further you can take crude oil Maybe it's got to an 83, 85. Maybe some of the banks are saying you could see 90. And I've even seen some forecasts, you know, they've got $100 crude. So that there's the first part. The second part is, uh, and when you're looking at nat gas, we're nearly at $6 for um, NYMEX nat gas. So I'm just looking here. You're, oh, it's just had a, it's absolutely rocketing. Um, you're now at $6.30. So it's just boomed. So there's the there's the, the second part as far as huge um, price volatility and price price um, spikes. As far as where we sit with Russia and we sit with Europe, we're facing naturally winter, and everyone is looking at making sure they've got adequate supply to uh, meet the demands of this European winter. So there's the storyline and certainly across to the UK. So the demand picture I think is going to increase. And the, the next part of that is, are there going to be any bottlenecks or any supply issues? So there's the, that's where we sit at, at the early part of October. And let's just hope that we don't see any issues one from electricity consumption, so they, they can fire up their power plants. Secondly, from demand and heating because of those cold European winters. And thirdly, we don't see any geopolitical shocks that impact uh, supply anywhere across those major markets. Right. Uh Peter, another question which we basically uh, have is, you know, uh, from if you just think from a China standpoint of view and what uh, news we are hearing out from them is basically Chinese governments have basically asked power producers to go all out for looking for resources so that the blackouts are reduced and from that point of view. Uh, view. Uh, also, there were a couple of articles where, you know, they were saying that uh, on, very on a short term measure, some of the imports have started trickling in from Australia, uh, but they're, they're pretty, pretty low in number. So from a Chinese standpoint of view, where, where do you think how long this crisis? Uh, I mean, uh, what options do they have? I mean, uh, do they, uh, I mean, apart from, you know, conserving and conserving energy and rationing it, what, what realistic options do they have? I, that's a very, for realistic options, they need, they need supply. And if they're not meeting that supply from other, um, other countries, then they're going to have a deficit and the deficit is going to be felt across to a consumer, to, to the end user. So that causes the blackouts, that causes the, the issue as far as electrification across the nation. So heavy industry has an impact. Um, all, all forms of um, yeah, manufacturing, if you can't provide the adequate power, so th these are just the issues. These are like, it's a little bit like a child, growing pains. 
And you you talk to a young child at you know 11 or 12 years of age or 13, and they they seem to grow. You, you see a child, you 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 know what your child, you put them to bed at, at 12 years of age, and you see them in the morning, and they seem to have grown, you know, maybe two centimeters. They just look bigger. Well, that's the issue, and those growing pains. This has been the issue facing China and many developing nations across the world for the last two decades. So I don't think that these issues, these are just ongoing concerns and ongoing um, dilemmas that every nation faces as far as securing their energy dependable, or well, the dependable source of energy that they're looking to, uh, to have for their in-base in consumers. Sure. And there's no other way around. It. This is just the, this is, these are the circumstances. This is the dance that they that they they're in, and there's nowhere to hide from it. Right, uh, Peter. Uh, another question, which basically on similar lines, is: Do you feel that the current crisis will also bring nuclear power back into focus? Because uh, that's one alternative source of energy from a base uh, power point of view which can come back which has been pushed into the sidelines over the last 10 15 years because of concerns but do you think nuclear power i, I mean you mentioned it that china doesn't have too much of freshwater resources but uh, do you think uh, nuclear power would come back into focus over the next let's say year or two well i would have thought so i mean there's yes i would think so but the, the dilemma is, does the world think so? And it's a clean burning fuel. There are issues as far as, you know, the uranium side, but yeah, I would have thought that it would have been greatly, uh, yeah, greatly rolled out, certainly across China and certainly across, you know, large nations. But the situation that we're facing ourselves, the addiction to cheaper forms of energy and, and being coal has been a, a lifeblood. And there is always, when you devote so much, and, and China's fortunate because it's got such large coal reserves itself. But if there's times that, you know, you, you, you've, got to, you've got the electrification of 1.4 billion people, everyone wants to... If you're living in a home, you want to flick a switch and the light comes on. It's as simple as that. And if you, I mean, that's the end game. The end game is flick the switch, the light comes on. With a brown out or a black out or whatever you want to call it, flick a switch and the power doesn't come on. <coughs> the consumer gets upset. Manufacturing takes a hit. And yeah, theoretically, which probably should have had a new, more of an aggressive, I think that the world probably should have been far more aggressive. I know Europe's been, um, they were very, very pro-nuclear. So, yeah, I don't think it's a bad thing, but that's only my viewpoint. Peter, one uh, further question from my end would be, you know, uh, we've seen this whole talk about, you know, China plus one from manufacturing point of view, from supply chain perspective. Uh, uh, how, I mean, the current crisis, both from the power sector and let's say real estate and everything coming in together. Uh, you, you've talked about uh, previously on this talk about how favorable nations and competitive advantages companies would need. But just from a de-risking perspective and, you know, what COVID has just brought everything back into focus that if one country goes down you just need you need to have supplies other uh, in other places do you think this uh, there will be more talk about this and uh, uh, about de-risking and you know de-risking your supply chain even at the cost of producing uh, at a slightly more expensive price or uh, bringing in more inflation but do you think this China plus one strategy uh, will get more fresh air because of the current crisis? I do in a lot of ways, but it's still, 
we've just got to work through the, the, the supply chains. We've got to be appreciative of all of the components of doing global business. We're coming out of a COVID pandemic that has rattled global consumers, global supply chains, <coughs> pardon me, and created naturally bottlenecks. And this is the point that really, as we move forward, how do, how do you stay competitive and how does your, how does your nation stay competitive if you're, if you're losing some of your manufacturing businesses to other nations? Um, it's always, a, it's like a war for talent. You know, we're at a point in time that, it, it, you know, Australia is going through a situation where we just haven't got, uh, we're not importing, people aren't coming here for work. I mean, we've got locked borders. So we've got supply issues as far as, in, uh, as, far as the employment sector. We've got very low unemployment. And it's, this is a similar situation that, you know, major nations are facing by countries, by companies moving their, their operations out of one country and going to a far more competitive company, a country. So I just think that where we're looking at the China One strategy, it's all right to have these, these um, aspirations and, and ideals, but we're still, we've still got to be very much appreciative that we're coming out of a, a COVID mindset that has really derailed a lot of the global businesses. And while some have performed quite well, there's still a lot that have been quite heavily hit. And the consumer, I think, is fragile. So we've just got to work through really the next three to six months to see where 22 plays from a stagflationary point of view and from a demand picture and GDP. And I think also, um, you know, many, many companies, whether there are going to be further issues, for an example, like Evergrande. Peter, I have just one final question before uh, we call this meeting a day. Uh, you know, with this unprecedented rise in prices of commodities, would it force a relook from an ESG standpoint on how they evaluate fossil fuel? They, they are the favorite bashing bags of ESG analysts and stuff like that. So would we need a more calibrated approach for carbon reduction so that it doesn't Im impact supply chains? And uh, is, is would, would they... Would you have a view on this, you know, for a hybrid solution from just from an ESG perspective? Well, I mean, every country has got their has got their own strategic objectives and what and what they're trying to uh, move towards. And I look at I look at a nation like Australia, where we've got huge amounts of energy, we've got solar, we've got wind, we've got nuclear, we've got coal, we've got oil, we've got gas. So I think you know the world has got to be mindful that that these to have these ideals take years travel quickly, right. and our addiction to fossil fuel energy sources has been an addiction that has lasted for the last 150 years. And it, it takes time to wean off these. I, I don't know how it goes. I mean, all, all I look at is we're consuming 100 million barrels a day. And what are, we, what are we going to consume in 20 years? Is everyone going to be driving an electric vehicle? Is everyone, I mean, I had a look at what happened in Texas going back into, you know, um, with that uh, winter storms that they experienced in February or March this year. And there was, you know, grave concerns there as far as, you know, new age energy. So these are issues that the world is going to have to live through. And it's not going to be an easy transitionary phase. So whilst I don't have an answer for it, I sit back here as a parent. I sit back here as a 
an observer to see how the world takes us on that journey. And I, I think I'm, I'm just going to sit here and just watch because I think it could be a, an incredible uh, experience. I think that our addiction to crude oil and our addiction to natural gas and coal, it's going to take a long time until we wean ourselves off those. And uh, I'm just interested to see how they play out. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Peter. I think it was a very insightful uh, session where I think a lot of participants had a lot of questions to ask on this, but just running short of time. So thank you. Thank you so much for taking out for the session. Thank you, participants, for joining with us. And I hope uh, uh, all of you are staying safe in this current situation. Thank you again, and I and to everyone, plenty of love, and uh, you've got a beautiful country. And I hope to get over there again and see you guys very, very soon. God bless. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Thank you so much. Bye.